I'm in Spanish Harlem. Oh, cool. Oh, welcome. Spanish Harlem in the house. All right. Um, well, welcome, Anna, and welcome, everybody, on Facebook Live and in the world to our Joycast 6. Um, I'm Ilana, and that's Catherine, and we are the founders of Camp Joy. Camp Joy is a company we started in the summer of 2020 because we wanted to help bring some joy and uh, just, you know, good energy to people out there. Uh, so it first started with an iteration. Catherine and I decided we wanted to be camp counselors one week in the summer. And then alas, a company was born. Um, so yeah, from there we've turned into working with teams and different companies on team bonding and things like that. But one of our favorite things to do is bring people each month and talk uh, during our Joycasts. Yes. So uh, the reason we started the Joycast is because um, everybody's experience of joy is really wildly different. And for us to understand joy and how we bring it to people, whether it's families or companies or individuals, we felt like we needed more information and more perspectives on joy. Um, and so Joycast has been this incredible space where we've talked to brilliant humans about what brings them joy, how they have cultivated a joy practice in their life, what joy means to them. Um, and slowly, slowly we're gathering, uh, like so much cool information about different ways that we can bring joy to others and different ways that people are experiencing joy. So, um, I have the extreme honor of introducing oh. Anna Stacy, who is an incredible human who we have like been chips passing in the night in real right. life for a very long time. Um, so it's really funny because we've never met in person. Oh, really? no. yeah. We've never met in person. We've only had a like incredible virtual liking at and hanging out relationship. I feel so lucky. Um, you know, I interviewed, I, I had been doing an interview project during COVID and I interviewed Anna and it was this amazing experience of someone who um, was working directly with a lot of people who were affected by COVID. And truly it was the most optimistic interview I encountered in the entire process. I interviewed like 300 people. It was wild. And I kept thinking about, wow, like to have such a perspective and to be such a versatile human, I, I'm just so floored by what you do. Um, I'm now going to read your fancy bio for everyone okay, um, or like pieces of it. And you can like, that. yeah, be, be filled with all the blushing that you need or not. Okay. Um, Anna Stacy is an actor, musician, writer, and medical student based in New York. Um, there are tons of credits, which we have on this event. So I'm not going to read out all your credits, but they're very cool. She is also a, the, in terms of writing, she has been published in different places. We love that. Um, at the icon school of medicine at Mount Sinai, Anna's focus is on human rights and access to care, particularly in emergency medicine as student director of the Mount Sinai human's rights program. Anna coordinated physical and mental health forensic evaluations for asylum seekers and organized the 2009. New York State training in medico legal interview and affidavit writing while also having a, a, an artistic career. I want to just like say that all of these things are happening at once, which is just incredible. Um, her most recent research examines resilience factors among survivors of the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami of 2011. Wow. Um, wow. Right. Uh, to get us started, we are curious when you meet someone new and they ask, what do you do? Um, <laughs> how do you respond to that type of question? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Um, I really think it depends on like what circle I'm in. Um, it used to be at the beginning of medical school that if I was, if I was in a show, I felt kind of embarrassed introducing myself as a medical student, uh, because uh, to other actors, because I was worried that they would not take me as seriously as an artist. Similarly, in medical school, I was sort of um, told that I wouldn't be able to continue a relationship with the arts uh, very early on in medical school, even before I officially enrolled. Um, so I was, I felt sort of sheepish calling myself an actor if it was something I wasn't going to be able to continue to do. Um, but now I primarily introduce myself as a medical student and an actor or an actor and a medical student, depending on where I am and what's on my mind. Um, I don't often introduce myself as a writer because I, I don't feel like I'm there yet. Um, but yeah, I think it really depends on context. <laughs> um, I'm curious uh, because, you know, this is Camp Joy, what you would say your definition of joy is? Oh, um, 
I think, so I was, I, I got this question ahead of time, just full transparency, and I still don't have an answer, but I, I do think that joy, um, joy has to be a surprise for it to be joy. If it's something mm -hmm. um, that you're expecting or something planned, then I think that's like contentment or peace. But I think joy is a, is a shock. Um, the most recent example I can think of is uh, I had like a half day earlier this week and I got to go for a run in the park by the reservoir and all the trees were in bloom. And it was just about the time of day where all like the elementary schoolers were getting out of school and they were there with like their parents, their caretakers with like ice cream, people were walking their dogs. And it was just like perfect weather. The wind was blowing over the water and I hadn't gone for a run in like an absurd amount of time. So it wasn't like a great run, but it was a wonderful experience. And like my music kicked in. I was like, oh, this is joy. This is fantastic. And I, I didn't expect that. It's so cool. We, uh, we, Catherine and I often, when we're talking about joy and defining it, we talk about, you know, uh, being fully present in a moment. And mm -hmm. I love that you're just very easily saying it's surprise because surprise is such a thing that like, you know, where we have to be, it requires us to be present. And that is it. I feel like that seamlessly comes together so nicely. I think so too. Yeah. Do you feel like that surprise? Well, I'm really curious because also you've been working in hospitals. Like one of the things that a lot of folks have been feeling throughout the pandemic is that lack of surprise. There's sort of this ongoing like hamster wheel of Zoom of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Have you felt like there's less surprise in your life throughout the last year? Um, I mean, I definitely have had the prerequisite Zoom fatigue that I think we all have had. Um, and there's hardly anything surprising about like logging into the same lecture again and again. Uh, but this is my first year in the hospital full time. Um, the first two years of medical school at most medical schools are what we call preclinical years. So you're mostly in lectures. Uh, third year for most people is where you start to go into the hospital. So uh, all of it is very new to me still. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't a pre-med student traditionally. Um, I'm at Sinai through a program called FlexMed, which um, admits non-traditional medical students uh, during their undergraduate years. I think you apply during sophomore year and then uh, you don't have to take the MCAT. The idea is to bring in students that have different interests in order to produce like doctors that are well-rounded holistic people, which um, I hope to one day be. Uh, but as a result, I like wasn't really plugged into the pre-med system. I wasn't like shadowing a lot. I wasn't doing a lot of research and I wasn't in hospitals a lot. So this year has really been my first experience seeing patients um, for real, you know, and uh, I, it does surprise me. Every single patient surprises me, um, not only because I like I'm still learning, but also I think because like it's exciting and. Yeah, I, like it's exciting to get to meet new people and mm -hmm. it's like such a privilege to get to meet people when they're unwell. Uh, that's mm -hmm. such a vulnerable time or it can be such a vulnerable time and no one wants to be in the hospital. It sucks like no one wants to be there. Um, so I find it. I do find it a joy to get to talk to new people every day in the hospital and help them try and feel safer. Mm. Have you ever felt in your, in your career and just your life in general, the different, like between being an artist and working in the medical field that you had to choose one or the other? Like, <laughs> I'm just curious because the, the huge commitments in both of those categories and fields, right? And so just like living in the middle, I'm just, I would love to hear about that process for you. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> um, this had been like a great source of angst for me earlier in medical school and later in college. Um, I, I applied and got in very early to medical school and sort of figured I could defer that decision um, until it, you know, the time came. Even when I was applying to colleges, I applied to some conservatories and even some tech schools and decided to go to Brown because it had no requirements. So I could sort of keep doing all of it. And then getting into FlexMed allowed me to keep doing all of it and not make a decision about it. Um, and then after college, I took um, some time off and was working in museum design and was working as an actor. I was like, also like applying to MFA programs. And I was like, okay, I can be an actor without an MFA. I cannot practice medicine without a medical degree. That's illegal. So um, I figured, <laughs> well, you shouldn't do it. Um, 
this is just like my own personal opinion. Um, so I, I figured, um, you know, I'd start medical school and if I really, really hated it for some reason, though I, I didn't expect I would, but if for whatever reason I really hated it, I would give myself the opportunity to like reevaluate and have that out. Uh, but I didn't hate it. <laughs> and um, I was told, I think, as I mentioned, like earlier in medical school, that I wasn't going to be able to continue like a robust relationship with the arts. And that was really painful to hear and to navigate. I remember feeling like angry a lot of the time, like something was being taken away from me, even though I had made both of these decisions like myself, no one was like forcing me to go to medical school and no one was forcing me to be an actor. Um, but just having to choose one or the other. I remember having this like distinct feeling of feeling like I had to like cut off a limb or something. It felt so essential and they, they both felt so essential that like I couldn't give one up. Um, and I love proving people wrong. <laughs> and I, I find a great amount of joy in that. <laughs> Maybe a, like a perverse joy. Um, and found I was able to continue both. Um, and I recognize that at certain points of my life, one is going to take priority over another, and that's just how things go. And I've actually been able to work it as an actor more during medical school than I had before. So that, that worked out well. In terms of how I see a distinction between the two, um, as time goes on, I realize that they're actually kind of the same for me. I think I'm in them for the same reasons. I like making quick trust relationships with people um, and bringing myself to an interpersonal interaction. And I think that that's like at the core of both medicine and acting. I love quick trust. <laughs> like what? That's exactly it. Like how fast can you get people on your team? Not in like a tricky way. Do you know what I mean? Not yeah, in like no, a no, sneaky. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, totally. But that's, I sit when I think about directing, that's exactly like you have to make these split second decisions and get people to believe in something really big right. and believe in something that's bigger than them. And I don't think about that with medicine. I think because um, uh, as a patient, I often feel very small. But I think that there's something like a really great doctor makes you believe that it's going to be all right. Like the end, like the the end of whatever is ailing you will come and they, it will be successful. Like that's so right on. I think that part of that small feeling, just like having been a patient myself is like we probably all have been, mm. comes from thinking that like the healthcare professional is sort of the one in charge. Like they're the mm. one driving the, the ship, right? But uh, one of my priorities as a clinician is to make sure that uh, patients know that like, this is their show. You're here because mm -hmm. this is your body, your brain, and your experience of your body and your brain and your illness or lack thereof. And like, you've felt empowered enough to come to see somebody to talk about that or to get evaluated. So like, we're here for you. We're here to support you. And together we're a team. I, I don't like the idea of like, healthcare providers making decisions for a patient. Mm. I think that like, it's really important to have that therapeutic alliance. Yeah, I, I see you doing the little, I don't, I'm not a fan of that power dynamic. Um, of course, it's going to be there no matter what. Um, and, and at the same time, like patients shouldn't come in, in my opinion, and like demand certain treatments. Like I saw this medication advertised to me and I need to have this medication. Like there's a reason why we have so much training. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do think it kind of has to be um, a relationship just like anything else where you sort of find a balance. Do you find that um, you're really supported in those ideas in in med in the field? Because I feel like, again, you know, it's such a mixed bag of doctors that I've seen in my life. And this is, you know, specific to me. So I can't I don't know what everyone else yeah. is doing. But, you know, I feel like half the time you meet doctors who like want to build a relationship and half the time you sort of feel like they don't. Um, look up from their chart yeah. and you're just sort of like in and out and there's no real like relationship building. I'm curious, like if you're seeing around you people taking on this idea of building trust or it's sort of a mixed bag in, in from your vantage point as well. That's interesting. I, I think that so much of like the history of medicine has this power dynamic baked into it. It's in the mm -hmm. language we use um, when we learn about 
medicine and uh, how we talk about patients, my least favorite medical term, it's nothing gross, my least favorite medical term is um, non-compliant. Uh, it's the term we use for when patients don't take medications as recommended. So if a patient decides not to take a medication or stops taking a medication or is only taking it like every so often, whereas you're supposed to be taking it every day, we would call that patient non-compliant with their medication. And the first time I heard that, I was like shocked. I think that's such an odd term. Um, it sort of implies that like the healthcare provider has set out a, a list of rules by which you have to comply. Um, I, I think that my medical education has done a good job of emphasizing that if a patient is, for example, non-compliant, that really might mean that we haven't done a good job of explaining how to take the medication mm. or why you need to take the medication. Um, Maybe there's another barrier to receiving the medication. Maybe you can't afford it. Maybe you don't have time to go to the pharmacy. So exploring what the other factors might be, that's actually mm -hmm. been like a pretty significant part of my medical education. In terms of how people are actually practicing, I, I do think, as you mentioned, it's a mixed bag. Um, luckily, I've seen mostly providers who do want to care for the patients. I think that mm -hmm. modern medicine is is really complicated and has a lot of technology built into it. And there's like legal stuff that like I don't even pretend to understand. And um, yeah, I, I do think that those are like factors that we all have to contend with as healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes it hard to engage meaningfully. But I, I don't know a single doctor, nurse, physician's assistant, medical student, like anybody who came into medicine because they don't want to help people. I do think that that's at the core of it for everybody. Yeah. Otherwise, it's like a hell of a commitment, like so much time and money and all those tests. It's horrible. Like, Oh my God, so little sleep. Like if, if you really didn't care about people, why would you do such a thing? It's, it's so real. <laughs> right? <laughs> I think we forget that though, right? Yeah, because totally. In the second, I mean, I whenever I'm meeting a doctor for the first time, I'm like, okay, I researched them. I looked them up online. So at least I know what they look like and what reviews are of them and things like that. But you have no idea what those first five minutes are going to be, which is kind of yeah. like weird. We don't even know what the first five minutes are. And as Catherine said, it's up to the director and just the production in general to build that relationship with the audience immediately. So like how are the doctors building the relationship with us within those first like five minutes? It's totally, yeah. Mm. Parallels are really cool, actually. I, I know, it's amazing. Do you, how do you feel like, I'm curious, you know, um, how has your acting been influenced by your medical practice and vice versa like do you see them show up inside of each other oh all the time I mean I'm sure you've had the experience as well of working on a show and you're like oh wow this is a direct resonance this thing I'm working on in my own life like this character is trying to work on like being more open and vulnerable psych me too like that's like the wonderful like tarot card resonance of acting I think um and similarly like I found that I'm a lot more attuned to people's experience this is not necessarily like a bad thing. I just want to say, but a lot more attuned to people's experience of suffering. Um, mm. Like I've seen a lot more of it in the last year than I ever have in the rest of my life combined. And um, as I said, I, I do think it's like such a privilege to get to see that. And I think a lot of people aren't exposed to suffering in the same, uh, you'd have to be in a particular like line of work or have something really traumatic happen to be exposed to suffering like that. And um, as a result, I think I have like a window into it that I wouldn't have mm. otherwise. And a lot of a lot of theater and probably a lot of film too that that's like less my area really exists at like these extremes of human emotion. Um, I mean, I think probably contemporary theater likes to live a little bit in the middle too. But um, <laughs> I'm more in classical theater, and they really love these extremes. Um, horrible, horrible things happen in Shakespeare plays, like horrific stuff. And it's not something that uh, I have like a touchstone for in my life, thank God. So um, having, yeah, having sort of a privileged vantage point into people's experience of like pain or loss or or death or, or even like joy is, mm. yeah, so special. <laughs> I was, I loved how um, when Catherine was naming your podcast or your joy cast, she, she said uh, joy is resilience. And I think a lot of that came from the conversation you all had previously. Um, this is such like a specific question, but like in what ways do you feel that you practice resilience? 
Oh, that's tough. So uh, as Catherine mentioned, some of the research I did a couple years ago did specifically focus on resilience. So it's something that I was thinking about pretty closely from like a research aspect for a while. Um, in terms of how I personally practice resilience, uh, Catherine, I thought it was like so funny that that's how the title of this particular episode got named because I, I think of joy as like such a fucking like punk rock act. <laughs> Like so many people, it's so radical. So many people don't want you to be joyful and so many people, yeah, so many people don't wish that for you. So to practice joy and to be joyful is so metal. <laughs> and I just, I think that that's, I find delight in, um, in subverting that. Do you know what I mean? Um, and uh, I, I guess I, I am not as intentional about finding joy as I would like to be. Um, there are, there are days where uh, I come home and I'm absolutely exhausted. I've had like 14 hours in like labor and delivery or something overnight. And joy is not really the first thing on my mind. Um, but I also wouldn't want to exist without it. Um, I do think it's important to take time to settle and reflect and whether that is joyful or not, I think that contributes to resilience. Do you find that um... I think some a stigma that goes along with acting is sort of this like um, eternally like waiting for someone to choose you thing, you know, like actors do a lot of waiting. And I imagine that um, you don't have a lot of waiting time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious, you know, how um, a lot of actors I know who, who are, are o- who only act are like, you know, I have to like make it through those dry times. And, and do you feel like, do you feel like you have a different appreciation for the in-between of each because you have the other? I mean, I'm trying to think to my most significant in-between, which is not to say that I'm like constantly booking things, but I, I'm trying to think of like, when that has been like a like a period of reflection um and certainly like earlier in the pandemic there before we like figured out zoom theater um there was <laughs> there was a much bigger lull uh boy i think we're sort of in a different uh stage of that yeah i think <laughs> thank past. thank goodness yeah, yeah. i think we, yeah we, We've all been traumatized in multiple ways, Zoom theater being <laughs> one of them. So some plays are really well suited to it. And I think like new works, like have a great home sometimes in digital theater. Um, and others like, I don't know, sort of hard to do, I don't know, Shakespeare play with a big ensemble. Who are you looking at? Why are we all surprised that Viola and Sebastian are both on screen? We can see we can see them both. It's fine, but we've done it. It's we're past it. But in any case, that was the biggest lull. And um, I found like a big creative void. And uh, around this time, I had really, as I mentioned, just started seeing patients. And the beginning of this year of medical school, like July, August for me was really difficult. Um, I started on my surgery rotation and uh, I'm not going to be a surgeon. I'm visually impaired and I don't enjoy surgery. No one wants me to be a surgeon. Patients don't want me to be a surgeon. Doctors don't want me to be a surgeon. And I certainly don't either. Um, and I was at the VA in the Bronx and uh, I, I saw I saw a lot of really difficult cases. And uh, without acting, I felt that I didn't have somewhere to put that. And I don't mean like in a therapy way. I just meant that I was I had all this emotion and I wanted to do something with it. I, I was happy to sit with it, but it felt like it was bigger than that, um, which is really why I started writing more, actually. Um, so I, I guess sort of my relationship with art maybe is more of a liquid than a solid. It's happy to take the shape of the container. Mm-hmm. I love that so much. I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm curious if you've ever done some dreaming about like you know, when you're in your 40s or when you're older, or 50s, whatever, how you see both of your fields put together? Do you have any like ideas of how you want to put art and medicine together in the future? I have no idea. So I am I have no idea. And I'm excited to figure that out. Um, I'm in the process just the very beginning right now of applying for residency, which is you're a, you're a doctor, you're like a real ass doctor, you have a salary, but you still report to a supervisor. So you're not the attending, the doctor in charge of the shift or in charge of the practice, you're a resident. Um, 
you've probably seen like medical TV shows. I'm not, I'm sure they talk about that on those. I haven't seen them because it's a little too close to life for me. <laughs> I don't watch Grey's Wait, Anatomy. Do you, you do not watch any of those no, shows? No, no, I don't. Um, I have never watched Grey's Anatomy. I've never watched like any of the big ones. Um, I think I saw like part of Scrubs for an assignment, but that's kind of it. <laughs> Actually, I was at a conference, like an emergency medicine conference, and like Zach Braff was the invited speaker, and he was like, what? "I, yeah, he he started. He was like, I don't really know why you guys wanted me here, because I, you know, I am not an actual doctor, right? Like I don't know anything. So wow. thank you for having me, but I really don't know what to say. And it was also like April or May of 2020, and he was like, I'm, I so don't belong here. <laughs> weird timing so funny like he was really good natured about it but he was like I I i'm so i'm sorry uh thank you to, to the healthcare heroes um that's all i got like it was it was pretty great um he, he did a good job considering <laughs> but in any case i i um i'm applying for residency in the next couple months and i've been getting a lot of advice solicited and unsolicited from residents and attendings that i've been working with about what to look for in a program and how to decide uh, what specialty I'd want to go into. And uh, advice that I get a lot from attendings, not residents, is to imagine where I would want to be in 30 years, which is insane. I'm not 30 now. I have no context for that like span of time. I can't imagine like greater than the amount of time that I've been alive. That's just like too big for me. Um, and when I was even like 15, I definitely wouldn't have been able to imagine being 26. Like I, I just had no context for it so i guess what i mean is that i i have no idea what it will be when i imagine it um i imagine i'll practice medicine and act kind of like i'm doing now um i am interested in emergency medicine for many reasons but one convenient reason is that it's very shift based and um you can have shifts at night or like front load your shifts in the month and then have the rest of the month to do like research or anything else and this would be my anything else Wow. I mean, it's so like, oh gosh, it's, it's, I mean, I love talking to doctors because I'm always, or just like on a social level, because I'm like, wait, explain to me how this works. So you do the rotations and then you do this. Da, 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 da. It's so, so much. <laughs> so much. And also my, my cousin, who's a doctor, she refuses to watch Grey's Anatomy, even though her mom and her uh, sister are obsessed with it because she literally will be in the same room. Like that is so incorrect. Like you can't, <laughs> do that like all the time a lot of them have consultants like I, I heard that they're like they're not terribly inaccurate yeah. um it's just like why would I come home after right. doing that and watch more of it totally. in my that free time so real that's so real but I guess the question I was going to ask though is while you're doing all the rotations do are you like like um feeling uh what kind of doctor you want to be? How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So these are sort of like trial runs yeah. um, where mm. we get to, yeah, we, we do like anywhere from four to eight weeks of a particular specialty. And during the third year, you have, at most schools, you have like a core set of specialties you have to do. And then during fourth year, you can explore a little bit more if you're interested in something that's not covered in the third year ones. Um, and you have elective time during third and fourth year to explore other things as well. So at the very beginning of the year, I started with an emergency medicine elective because I had a feeling that that's maybe what I was interested in and I did love it and that was very affirming. So during the rest of the year when I was on rotations that I wasn't as interested in or that were a lot more grueling, I was like able to come back to emergency medicine, to like critical care as something I really enjoyed um, as like mm. a touchstone. If I want to do that, I have to get through OBGYN. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. Um, I'm curious, uh, as you have, you know, been in hospitals and seeing patients at this, like you're saying, this vulnerable time, this privileged time, um, I'm curious if you've seen ways that they've cultivated joy inside of really hard moments. Hmm. I actually think that, especially during pediatrics, I was seeing a lot of that. Like mm -hmm. a lot of the kids, I was on pediatrics in December. Um, so schools had opened and then closed again. And a lot of these kids were really, um, really isolated and getting bored and getting lonely. And um, especially the young kids I really felt for because maybe they didn't have as much opportunity to like socialize, develop friendships as like high school aged kids. Um, mm. And 
I actually really loved pediatrics in a way that surprised me. I don't know any children in my like day to day life. I don't have friends with kids. So uh, I, I didn't know what to expect. And I, I really did love it, partially because I found that like young, young people are really good at finding joy <laughs> and it really delights me. Um, I have in my living room, like on a cork board, this drawing that like a six year old patient of mine did. And it's just a scribble and he gave it to me. He was like, this is a drawing of a spicy chip. And I, I do love that so much. I love that so much because it really delighted him and he knew exactly what he wanted to communicate with that. And like, I don't know, that really like makes me so happy whenever I see it, I just think it's so funny. And he, he like scribbled it with such a vigor. He was clearly trying to indicate how spicy this chip was with like how hard he was pressing the crayon. Um, I thought wasn't a very specific answer to your question, but I guess like, everybody's been finding joy and whether that's trying spicy chips or like being like some people made appointments with the doctors like as a means of self-care like gosh i haven't seen my pcp since 2019 would love to get on that because like taking care of my body is something that makes me feel better yeah i love that i love a spicy chip <laughs> I love a spicy chip and also love a great drawing. That's like, not just given with like, this is for you. Cause I like you, but like, this is a, a piece of art. So like take good care of it. Thank it was you. so special. It was so special. So like cork board in your living room. Cork yeah, board yeah, in it's the right room. there. It was so important. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, Catherine, I think it's time for hot seat. I, it's time for hot seat. Okay. So oh, no. At the, no, you're great. You're going to love it. At the end of our joy cast, we do something called hot seat, which we also do a lot in our camps. Um, we're going to ask you some rapid fire questions. You uh, should answer with your, the first impulse that you have, you cannot get them wrong. Um, they're just <laughs> some fun questions to send us out. So um, we can get a peek into some of your other funny joy things in your life. Love it. All right, let's um, do it. All right, let's do this. Let's see. All right. What is the thing you wake up in the morning looking forward to? Uh, coming home and taking off my work shoes and getting to play some guitar. Love it. What are you playing on the guitar right now? Uh, I don't really work on any particular pieces. It's usually I play what I've been listening to. I've been listening to a lot of Phoebe Bridgers recently. Love it. Um, can you describe your perfect day? Perfect day. Um, I wake up still early because I'm stuck on an early sleep schedule, but a little bit later. So I'm thinking like 8, 830. The sun's like shining, but not in my face. I get to have a luxurious breakfast where I don't have to study anything while I have breakfast. And then I can read. Oh, I could read while I have breakfast and take a long walk with my roommate afterwards. Uh, maybe like walk all the way down Manhattan, like walk through the park. Um, I don't know, see some friends, hang out outside for as much of the day as possible and um, have a cold beer outside while it's still nice and then come back inside and watch a really shitty horror movie. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite horror film? Oh, favorite is, okay. I have my favorite like really bad one. It's not really no. bad. Okay, so my comfort movie is The Ring, which is an absurd yeah. comfort movie, but it's so good and so bad. Um, I really, really love the way that she picks up the phone when she thinks it's Samara, but it's actually her ex. And she goes, leave him alone! It's so horrifically bad. And some of it's actually really good. The soundtrack is really decent. I don't know. That movie just brings me a lot of comfort. <laughs> wow. Is the, is the ring. ring. Okay. Wow. That's Obsessed. <laughs> I mean, I get it. I was saying the other week that the reason I love horror right now is because you think the world we're in is nuts. And then you watch horror and you're like, oh, it's no, it's not. No, it's Catherine, not. have you listened to the Gimlet podcast of the Scaredy Cat? Oh, my God. What's it called? It's like the, oh. the Scaredy Cat Horror Show. It's excellent. They bring on some really good guest stars, um, including Carmen Maria Machado, who's like an amazing. I'm writer. obsessed with She's her. Incredible. And to hear her talk about like Hereditary and Midsummer, it's like so delightful. Highly recommend. But um, a great deal of the podcast is talking about how like horror movies are so comforting. <laughs> They're so comforting. Have yeah. you read Have you read In the Dream House? No, I haven't. I'm reading um, Her Body oh. and Other Parties right oh, now. Oh my so gosh! Good. Yes, I love that. It, when you have When you've read In the Dream House, let me know. It blew my brain open. G greatest thing I've read in years. Oh God, so amazing. So I know we have to. Okay, gotta keep going. Um, what is one thing that What is one goal you're in process with right now? Um, to feel 
more confident as an artist. I do a lot of doubting myself as an artist. Also, like, in the hospital, I doubt myself a lot, too. Um, and I'm finding it especially difficult to not doubt myself over virtual um, virtual acting because I, I, as I might have mentioned, I'm visually impaired, so I, like, really am not getting a lot of the visual feedback from people that I normally would get, and everyone's muted, so I really... Um, I have to rely more on intrinsic measures of confidence rather than extrinsic. Mm. And I'd like to carry that forward when we're no longer virtual. You're <laughs> wow. I'm obsessed with that answer. That's incredible. <laughs> like all, all <laughs> of us, all of us. Uh, yes. You speak to my soul. Um, okay. What is, okay. If you could not be an artist or a doctor, what is one other career you'd be interested in? <sighs> I think I'd really like to be like a travel journalist or um, like a chef. It's a similar kind of creativity. Uh, chef maybe less like interpersonal, uh, but I really just like talking with people. That's awesome. And really like fast paced environments. Where, yeah, like, yeah. I like might or may not be yelling at you. Exactly. <laughs> um, what, who is one person you admire? Uh, I really admire my roommate. Um, mm. Oh my God, I'm like tearing up. She's so wonderful. Um, she's um, she's a writer and uh, we're working on this web series together right now. It's the second series of a web series and the first season was virtual and this season's gonna be in person, which is so exciting. And um, I'm probably a, a really difficult uh, creative collaborator because of my schedule. And uh, she is just, amazing like she turns all this shit out and it's all incredible <laughs> and she's kind and she makes my lunch for me when i'm really busy like that's just like what's the... her name her name is nicole martinez she's like nicole! the best person i know yeah, i know nicole! we love nicole we do love nicole that's my platonic uh, wife <laughs> yeah it's great. yo a lot of friends are getting married these days that is what is the new trend is friends platonic loves marrying one another i found honestly this. like insurance stuff depending we'll have to talk about it yeah truly yeah um uh what is who is one person you secretly admire secretly admire okay this is a new one for me um i have been reading a lot about taylor swift recently because i'm in this show where i'm playing a character who uh, I'm playing like a pop star who like loses control of their masters or never had control of their masters. And then they, they uh, are dropped by their label. So they'll never get control of their masters. And I just didn't know anything about any of this. Uh, so I was doing a lot of reading and I was like, wow, Taylor Swift is like, like also really fucking punk rock. Who knew? Like very badass. This thing where she's like recording all of her songs again. That is so cool. And like, I thought she was really lame and I guess I was wrong. And I started listening to her more of her music, like her recent stuff. And it's pretty good. Have you watched the yeah. documentary? No, the doc that's actually on my list. Cause I need to watch it for research. You should watch it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really incredible. Cause she talks about how so much of, I think some of the reasons we all were like, oh yeah, whatever Taylor Swift is because of how she was always told to be a good girl. And oh. she like grew up sort of being inundated in this very gendered public way. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Everybody watch the movie. Amazing. Um, what is your favorite sound? My favorite sound. Oh, uh, you know, that sound when you can hear somebody smile and it's like a, like a crinkle, like a, like it, it's probably the spit on their teeth. It, yeah. So <laughs> Doctor no, I actually think it's a visually impaired response. Because <laughs> sometimes, like, um, it's so useful that I'm like now listening for it instead of looking for it. Because if like if I'm at a party or something, mm -hmm. I really love hearing that sound. Um, yeah, and especially with the masks, I find that really useful. Oh my gosh! Yes, yes. I'm, like seeking that out, that sound. Uh, yeah, so weird. I like didn't notice it much before this year, but now I'm like really looking for it. Yeah. Wow. I have one final question for you. What is your favorite thing in your room and will you show us? Okay. I have a new favorite thing. I have a mint plant. <laughs> oh, it's a plant! This is my mint oh, plant. Oh, no. So happy. It stays on my windowsill. I like didn't think I had enough room for plants previously and I have just enough room for just this plant. Um, I can't really open the windowsill. Like mm -hmm. I have a fire escape there, but I'm right above a, a police yard. So I don't have 
uh, access to that um, space the way I'd like to, but I have enough room for this plant and it smells really good. And my roommate makes fun of me when I come out of my room and I'm chewing something because she knows it's one of the leaves. <laughs> and it's grown so much, it got so big. Oh, oh I know, it makes me so happy. Does it have a name? Does your plant have a name? I thought it did, but I've forgotten it, which means that it exists on its own terms, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I agree. Yeah, it happens. I've named a lot of my plants and then I'm like, oh, I forget. Just I've gone on named Herbie already, so like this one can't be Herbie. I just know that that's I have a Herbie plant too. I think we all have Herbie plants. Right. It's like the spot of like it's like spot for dogs or whatever, right? Fido. Yeah, exactly. The plant name. <laughs> amazing um wow it's been so incredible to talk to you i'm Likewise. just holy moly um can you tell folks who are watching this now slash will watch it on youtube later where they can find you on the internet sure um if you're so inclined uh i've got a website it's a n n a hyphen s t a c y anastasi no e dot squarespace dot com gonna have to get on that domain name biz and um you can find um credits for my acting there you can find links to my writing and uh examples of my graphic design which is just like how i make money um and you can find me on instagram at a c e y s t a c y again no e and stacy that's probably all of my homes in the oh i do my god thank you so oh, much no. oh also i'm a designer cash no 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 that's just like my way to be able to like live in New York, because um, New York is a very expensive place to live. Um, so that's like, I've been doing that since like high school to exist, yeah. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank this you. Was so wonderful. You're amazing. We're gonna turn off the live stream. Thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>